April 20, 2007, Beijing Dance Academy. These young ladies are learning a dance with a distinct Sendawan flair. Those familiar with this dance will realize that its structure bears a striking resemblance to the dance depicted in Dunhuang's murals. How did these children who grew up listening to modern pop music come to learn a traditional dance long thought to be lost? That's because each of these young ladies has a dream, and some of them must be related to Dunhuang. For many years now, I've had the same dream. I'm in the desert. There's a woman slowly walking towards me. She looks like a dancer from ancient times or a spirit, like a painting from the caves deep in the deserts come to life. She slowly begins to dance as if she were a desert blossom coming into full bloom. This dancing dream slowly takes me through the sands of time. This is a miraculous time machine. Through it, the lives, beliefs, leisurely activities, and visages of people from a thousand years ago come to life. At the time, music and dance were highly valued parts of everyday life. Within the 492 caves preserved in Dunhuang, aspects of these artistic pursuits are seen everywhere. Of the depictions of dancing, the majority are of Fei Tian. Approximately 4,500 large and small representations of Fei Tian exist within Dunhuang's murals. Of those 4,500, the oldest depiction is dated to be over 1,600 years old, while the youngest clocks in at close to 600. Are these paintings of ancient dancers? Or are they spirits who reside in paradise? Or are they the fantastic fabrications by the artists? These angels, whose robes flutter in the imaginary wind, remain a riddle yet to be solved. In the countless historical documents that mention dances, we have yet to find a complete story involving any of the dancers. Under the guidance of Dunhuang Academy scholars, we have created the story of a dancer named Cheng Fu Er. Hers is based on the thousands of historical folk artists and dancing instructions. Her story will help us to understand this nebulous past. Chen Fuar, whose family hails from Dunhuang, spent the Tianbao era in Chang'an studying dancing. It is 755 AD, and a day like any other within the Imperial Palace. Music drifted through the air around the Huaqing Hot Springs. Ever since Emperor Xuanzong ascended to the Tong throne, peace has reigned throughout the land. Dancing displays such as this one were regular occurrences at the Imperial Court. Women of Central Asian descent were found all throughout Chang'an. They frequented the capital's taverns and mansions. Their music and dancing gave an air of grace and romance to life in the city, prompting the poet Li Bai to write, 
In the eastern city, a rich young man rides against the spring wind upon his white stallion. Frantically, he rides onwards. He arrives smiling to the Hulas Tavern. These young women had an ace up their sleeves, a whirling, flight-like dance called the Hushuan. Performers of this dance spin round and around at breakneck speeds whilst remaining upon a small circular rug, their clothes trailing through the air. It is said that after this dance spread to the government courts, it became An Lushan's strong suit. Doubtless that when he did it, his corpulent body looked like a spinning top. During the Tang Dynasty, no matter if one was a noble or a commoner, music was a unifying element. In addition, since music had permeated Tang culture so pervasively, music and dance traditions from the Tang's frontiers were able to integrate and mix with their Chinese counterparts. In this golden age of cultural expression, Cheng Fu honed her talents. While the mighty Tang dynasty immersed itself in these cultural exploits, the Hu Xuan dancing An Lushan raised his flag of rebellion. Tan Xuan Zong and his beloved concubine Yang Guifei were forced to flee the capital. Subsequently, future prospects of dancing within the imperial palace Subsequently, future prospects of dancing within the Imperial Palace slipped further and further away from Fu'er. Her only hope now lay in her hometown, thousands of leagues in the distance, Dunhuang. During the Tang Dynasty, Dunhuang was a Buddhist holy land constantly shrouded in the incense of countless Buddhist offerings. 25 kilometers away southeast of Dunhuang city limits stands the countless cave shrines of the famous Mogao Caves. The regular visits of the people to the Mogao Caves have become an important part of their daily lives. One of Buddhism's scriptures, the Lotus Sutra, lists ten ways with which worldly adherents can nourish their faith. The ninth is through the arts. The arts that this sutra refers to are Buddhist songs and dances which praise Buddha and the Bodhisattvas. The music and dance serve to nourish and strengthen those beings in the pure world. Because of this, we are able to see many depictions of dancing upon the walls of the Mogao Caves. This is a dance from one of Dunhuang's frescoes come to life. This reproduction of the actions recorded by the painting is the work of an expert from the Chinese Academy of Arts by the name of Wu Man Ying. In June of 1977, a small dance research group organized by the Chinese Academy of Arts headed towards China's northwestern region. Their mission to awaken the dances that hibernated within the region's ancient murals. This is a group photo taken of five team members and Mr. and Mrs. Chung Chu Hong. This is amazing. I feel like uh, I should shout my thanks to Donghuang. Seriously, this place is a music and dance hall. Nearly every cave has records of music and dance. I can hardly believe this is real. This expedition, undertaken in the summer of 1977, lifted the veil over Dunhuang's musical murals. Those paintings, having hibernated for these past thousand years, certainly never imagined that they could spring to life once more off the stone walls, 1,000 years later to become treasured practices 
to the descendants of their subjects. It has been over 1,600 years since the oldest of these dancing murals were painted in the present day. Between these two eras, no one can be for certain how much they have suffered. Warfare, vandalism, weathering, the scars they left, the mottled marks they leave across these paintings, those we can see with our own eyes. Let us return once more to that dancer in training, Cheng Fu Er, who returns once more to her homeland to escape the chaos of war. In order to make the 2,000 kilometer journey from Chang'an to Dunhuang, the duration of travel for Chen Fu Er, who in journeyed alone, if taken non-stop, would take roughly three months. On her way home, Chun Fu Er met a caravan of Sogdian merchants traveling from the west, who came to China to sell their cargo of exotic furs. Their plan had also been disrupted by the conflict. Chang'an has become an unreachable goal for them. This day she saw some fellow Dunhuang natives, fellow weary solitary travelers far from home. Fuo Er regaled them with tales of her time spent dancing to the marvelous music within the Imperial Palace. From a young age, Cheng Fu Er was selected for the Imperial Dancing School, an institution established to train dancers for the Emperor himself. Girls from humble households all over the Empire were recruited into this school. They were trained in the fashionable songs and dances of the time, and to play instruments such as the pipa, sunshine, and the harp. The school was very different from the ministries of ceremonies. The ministry was responsible for religion, rites, and traditional rituals. Music, celebrations, and merrymaking were taught at the school during Tang Xuanzang's reign. The school was at the zenth of sophistication and enrollment. This is a miniature painting regarding the lives of palatial dancers and musicians. It has detailed depictions of Tang era court entertainments, performances, mannerisms, and fashions. From this image, we can more or less reconstruct the choreography involved in the spectacular displays that were hosted in the Tang Imperial Palace and the music that accompanied them. Xuanzang was not only a fine connoisseur of the arts, but a participant. It is said that he was a good drummer and knew his way around tonality. The Son of Heaven was truly a talented individual. This is the Olympic event dressage. It takes a talented trainer six to seven years to train a horse to be able to dance like this. During Xuanzang's reign, the Tang Dynasty had raised horses to perform these complex movements. The relief decorating this gold and silver pot found in Shanxi shows one such horse holding a wine cup in its mouth, kneeling before the emperor during his birthday celebrations. During the Anxi Rebellion, a lot of the show horses escaped to citizens' houses. Once they heard music, the horses would start dancing. This perplexed the residents, who at first thought the beasts were possessed. It was only later that they realized that these horses were trained to dance at the beat of any music that they heard. The Tang Dynasty prosperity was unrivaled and Cheng Fu er was able to experience this era in all its glory. Miss Gong Sun was a star dancer known throughout the nation during this time period. 
Her choreography included sword forms, incorporating their flowing movements into her huntuo dance. The beautiful military-inspired costumes she designed for these dances became a fashion trend imitated by many noble women. Can you feel the imposing aura emanating from this calligraphy? It is said that the Tang calligrapher Huai Su received the inspiration for this work from Miss Gong Soon's dances. The Taiwanese dancer Lin Huai Min used this calligraphy in turn to create his free-flowing dances. Much time has passed between Miss Gong Soon's sword dances immortalized in the Mogao Caves murals to Huai Su's bold calligraphy during the Hai Tong to Lin Huai Min's free flow dance in 2006. But they retain the same mystique and atmosphere. That is the miracle of culture. It incessantly influences and interacts with things around it until it is passed down to future generations. From a modern standpoint, the dancing instructions of the Tang Dynasty were very well-rounded. For ease of instruction and dissemination, there were even diagrams especially made for the purpose. Several such scrolls found in Dunhuang were taken by Stein back to England, where they now reside in the British Library. Since the beginning of the 20th century, countless experts studied the forms described within to no clear conclusion. However, what they do agree on is that during Tong celebrations, a popular form of leisurely dance was called the Da Ding Dance. Now, I'm sure that we are all familiar with the type of dancing involved with a modern banquet. Now let's take a look at this painting of a Tong wedding celebration. During the bride's wedding banquet, a performer within the wedding tent sings and dances alone in a display of congratulations for the newlyweds. This was a common ceremony for residents of Dunhuang over a thousand years ago, and was even considered a form of Buddhist worship. The adherents at the time conveyed their worship to Buddhism through music and dance. Chung Fuor lived in this kind of environment, the atmosphere of that age. The atmosphere of that age of unsurpassed prosperity had such a rich body language, and rich rhythmic music filled the air. This was the most difficult journey of Chung Fuor's life. Having grown up in the Imperial Dancing School, her life was filled with dance, and her knowledge was limited to only dancing. Now she had to learn how to survive this time of hardship on the fly. The city that we see is peaceful and bustling compared to the war-torn Chang'an. We cannot even imagine the opulence of Dunhuang during the Tang. It was an important trade hub on the Silk Road, the most important Eurasian trade route at the time. It was an essential stop for traveling merchants. People of Han, Sogdian, Turkic, and Uyghur descent called the city their home, and adherents of all manner of faiths mingled and interacted within its walls. Through this cosmopolitan makeup, Dunhuang achieved its tremendous prosperity. The officials and aristocrats of the region surrounding the Gansu Corridor had a tradition of having household performers. When leaving for a long-distance trip, they would be accompanied by a large, ostentatious procession of musicians and dancers. In this late Tang period painting, Zheng Yichao sets forth, it isn't hard to find his procession of conspicuously showy performers. If Cheng Fu Er, who grew up in the Imperial Palace, saw such a scene, would she be tempted to join in? Would this familiar display in an unfamiliar city have filled her with longing for her home? Cheng Fu er set off in the direction for home, following her fuzzy childhood memories, but she has long since lost her way. Meanwhile, the Tong Empire. 
Meanwhile, the Tang Empire was thrown into disarray by the Anxi Rebellion. Xunzong was making his way for the safety of Sichuan, but he remains devastated by the loss of young Guifei. The Crown Prince Li Bing was still in the middle of gathering an army to retake Chang'an and Luoyang. Separated from the imperial court with no way home, Cheng Fu'er was forced to rely upon the skills she learned in the palace to survive. People who saw this imperial dancer were awed by her technique. Even the ever-busy local craftsmen came to see her dance. Just like modern-day artists search for inspiration in the field, just like modern-day artists search for inspiration in the field, the craftsmen burned the image of Miss Four deeply into their own minds. Immortalizing this memory on the walls of the Mogao Caves. While the images we see in the frescoes today reflect the scenery of the Buddhist ideas of paradise, the forms of the bodhisattvas were drawn by the craftsmen based on the women around them. This is a case of life imitating art, and it was deemed bodhisattvas as courtesans. Only Cheng Fu Er never would have imagined that these events would be reproduced a thousand years later on a theater stage as a scene in a ballet. That ballet is the 1979 internationally acclaimed ballet Along the Silk Road, which ended the era of one billion people being enthralled by eight puppet operas and was called the Swan Lake of the Orient. The entire ballet's choreography was inspired by the many dances seen in the frescoes of Dun Huang. Just how did the choreographers translate the static images painted on the cave walls into fluid animated dancing. An S-shaped structure, a winding rhythm. If you don't have this winding rhythm, you may be able to incorporate some of the discoveries of Don Hong, but you lose most of the flavor. It feels totally different if you have that rhythm. See there? If you map out the path, then draw a wind path, then rearrange the events, there you go. It feels very different, in a very good way. The dance performed by the pipa playing heroine of the ballet exemplifies the unique characteristics of the serpentine dances found in Dun Huang. The original source comes from a sculpture of a pipa playing bodhisattva found in cave 112 of the Mogao Caves. Maybe this truly is a faint shadow of how Cheng Fu Er kept herself alive all those centuries ago. To modern observers, the skillful playing of the pipa requires almost superhuman ability. Regardless of whether this technique is based on a real figure, event, style, or sound, or if it is the fabrication of a local craftsman, this posture has become iconic of our understanding of the cultural expression of the Tang Dynasty over 13 centuries ago. Within the Tung Court's musical bands, the pipa's importance was akin to a first-string violin in a modern orchestra. Qingsheng, Xiliang, Gaocheng, and other popular compositions of the time featured the pipa prominently. This Indian-style five-stringed pipa is similar to the types that would have appeared in front of the Tung Court. There are few pipa left in the world dated to the Tang Dynasty. 
We cannot be certain whether Cheng Fu Er ever played a pipa like this, but regardless, she never did return to that courtly lifestyle ever again. Tune. It is regarded as the first dance accompaniment of the Tang Dynasty, the Song of the Colorful Plumage. Its origins are the basis of a myth. On the eve of mid-autumn, whilst the Xuanzong Emperor was gazing at the full moon, he was struck by a vision of himself at Cheng'e's palace on the moon. He was surrounded by countless fairies, who danced to dulcet music. After he regained his senses, he could only remember half of the song. Later, once he heard the Brahmin song gifted to him from India by the governor of Xiliang, he was able to fill in the gaps. Yang Guifei personally choreographed her dances according to the music. Bai Ju Yi expressed his admiration. Of the countless songs and dances, my most beloved is the Ni Chang dance. That dance elicits memories of the best years of Cheng Fu'er's life. Ever since she was recruited into the dance school, she had been preparing herself to showcase her best performance to Yang Guifei, who, having greatly enjoyed said performance, repeated the dance in a private performance to Li Longji, the brilliant emperor. For Fuer, her previous life of learning and performing one dance after the other was a much preferred state. Today, in Lanzhou, some 1,000 kilometers away from Dunhuang, the Dunhuang dances have already become her calling card. In 1978, when Silk Road had yet to reach its peak popularity, the director of the Academy of Art of Gansu Province, Gao Jinrong, was already deeply researching the Mogao Caves for its depictions of ancient dances, and had already introduced courses about such in his school. From the age of black and white photos to color video, from childhood to an esteemed researcher. Over the past 40 years, Gao Jin Rong never stopped his pursuit of those dances. Finally, he was able to incorporate the techniques passed down by generations by hand into a distinct Dunhuang school of dance. All of this was made possible by the hive-like network of caves at Mogao. Cheng Fu'er had heard countless descriptions of the Buddhist paradise found within the Mogao Caves. Her father had even spent some time as a worker constructing new caves. She was still amazed by what she saw in person. Inside many of the caves were fantastical paradises filled with music and dance. The scenery within was all too familiar to her. The majestic gazebos and bridge streams almost make her feel as if she was back in the Imperial Palace. There were more amazing scenes she had never encountered before. sat in meditation upon lotus thrones, an expression of tranquility upon their faces. Celestial spirits, called Feichan by later generations, rode upon rainbow-colored clouds, spreading blessings upon those below them. These spirits long ago shed their original demeanors, taking on a whimsical mood, 
hands clasping instruments that the court dancer was intimately familiar with. Within this depiction of paradise, there was no war, no exodus, no hunger, nor disease. She was able to forget all the frustrations in her life and imagine a perfect existence. With this thought, it is as if she herself began to dance in sync with the Fei Chan. These moving murals from over a thousand years ago have long since lost their vibrant colors. But even all these years later, for pilgrims arriving at the Mogao Caves, these images are still filled with an animate sense of spirituality and elegance befitting of those courtly dancers. The instant when I first laid eyes upon Dunhuang was the most important moment in my life. It left me with an indestructible image in my mind. So I think that when I saw the form and the dance and technique of Dunhuang, and when I saw that, I feel like I can confidently say that it is the most cherished thing that I have in my life right now. At the end of the 1970s, the Taiwanese dancer Fun Jin Shu who had been studying abroad in Japan, made a beeline straight for Dunhuang. Upon seeing the frescoes filling Mogao's caves, she felt a sense of completion. It's possible Cheng Fu was filled with these same emotions. Over the next 20 years, Fun Jishi took this impression and the thoughts they inspired with her to countries all over the world, including Germany and the United States. The impression I got was that I had achieved something, an inspiration of sorts. However, I hope that my dancing form is more abstract and that I can give an extension to the cultural experience of Dunhuang, bring it into the modern era. This is the Beijing Baole Theater's 2007 major production, Dunhuang. To the left first! Bring your legs in! Stand up! Don't move the back leg! Yes, yes! First bring your legs in! Fan Jishi was the chief choreographer of dance for this production. This was the most important performance of her life, the first time she was able to showcase the dance that she learned from Dunhuang to the Chinese public. From the first time she saw Dunhuang to her romance, marriage, and career, all of these things were melded together in the performance. Like the Fei Chen of Dunhuang's murals, she offered all of herself as a tribute to Dunhuang's dance. Fan Jishu believed that she had reached the endless paradise in her mind, Dunhuang. As for Chang Fu Er, she had gradually become accustomed to life in Dunhuang. From being selected for the Imperial School at 13, to performing for the Emperor, to her transformation into a street performer, 
dancing has become her way of confronting the chaos of life. Fortune comes and goes without warning. During the dead of night, when Chung Fu's mind wanders, she often reflects upon those times of warmth and stability. Dong Huan's temple residences included professional musicians and performers, what we would today call spiritual entertainers. Especially, you know, for religions, the ceremonies are often expressed through music. They were responsible for using music to communicate their message of faith and create a solemn atmosphere. Maybe Chung Fu -er did as the experts said and joined the temple's sound team with the Buddha's blessings. Spending her life tending to the temple and furthering the teachings of Buddha. Or maybe she met an artist who tickled her fancy, settled down, and raised a family with him. After all, when you've spent your entire life without a home, wouldn't you yearn for the warmth of home and hearth? Shortly after Chung Fu -er arrived in Dunhuang, its trade lanes to Chang'an were severed by the ongoing conflict. However, its trade routes with Chuzi to the west remained unmolested. In time, the dancing styles of Central and Western Asia began to exhibit properties found in the dances of Chinese court dancers. It would not be a large assumption to make that this may have something to do with the exodus of courtly entertainers like Chung Fu Er. But sadly, these remain conjecture. Who's to say, in the grand tale of history, one dancer is but an insignificant grain of sand in a large desert. Their fates remain unknown to us. In the historical records, 10,004 dancers passed through the doors of the dance school during the Tianbao era. Their escape from the violence, scattering to the winds, and absorption into the greater population remains but a single phase in the... And then it goes Chinese. This is the girl that was imitating that ancient dancer Cheng Fu Er. She studies Dunhuang's dances at the Gansu Provincial Academy of Art. As we finished recording for this episode, she had been accepted into the Beijing Dance Academy's program for ancient dances. Fate has been kinder to her than Cheng Fu Er. Her dreams have just started after leaving her hometown of Gansu for school in Beijing. Dunhuang, a miracle of civilization, carries the fossilized history and outflowing verve at the same time. From ancient dancers Chung Fu Er to the youth in Academy of Art, they all dance for Dunhuang. Culture is a wonderful thing which is tied in a hundred and one ways is doing something with the strong vitality of Dunhuang frescoes. Let's take another look at these adorable youth. They are nearing the middle of their teenage years, the first class of the Beijing Dance Academy's Dunhuang Dances program. I feel that Dunhuang's dance has a sense of spirituality. It's so mysterious. I feel that Dunhuang's dances are a way of passing on Dunhuang's culture. We use them to broadcast Dunhuang's culture to the public, bringing these things to a modern audience.
same diligence, her shadow has been firmly cemented onto Dunhuang's frescoes. But these youth showed themselves for the first time at the opening ceremonies for the 2008 Olympics. Over a thousand years legacy of culture, dynastic transitions, passage of time, warfare, and devastation were shown as the figures of Dunhuang's murals come to life.